Hello, viewer. You hit play. You waited those excruciating five seconds to skip that ad and you maybe brushed the Cheeto dust out of your keyboard and should probably clean that later. But that's later, here, now. We are beyond time itself, beyond space and fantasy. We are entering the world. Are, are we the even real. real? Is this even real? In this world. <laughs> is, is, is any of this real? Is anything real? I don't know, Jim. Is any of it real? <laughs> I'm Jonathan Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, and we're gonna make your world feel real on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by World Anvil, the ultimate world building platform for game masters and writers. World Anvil is awesome for building your homebrew and managing your campaign. They put the full D&D SRD at your fingertips, plus character sheets for Pathfinder 1 and 2, Call of Cthulhu, Savage Worlds, and over 30 other RPGs. You can find information easily and share your lore and homebrew with your players in interactive maps, timelines, calendars, and more. And their campaign management tool and digital DM screen help you organize your game and keep track of your sessions, NPCs, music, and everything else. The free version gives you all the major features, but guild membership gets you advanced presentation options and so much more. Use the voucher code WEBDM for 20% off six or 12 month memberships of Master and Grandmaster tier. Link in the comments and description. Okay, Jim, we make these worlds, we create them in our minds. When we talk about making these worlds feel real, oh, right, yeah. to, to everyone yeah. at the table, yeah, uh, everybody watching, like, what what does that ex what does that mean? What does exactly? it mean? Yeah, yeah. I feel what you're saying because it's like because the, they're not real. They're not they? real. I mean, they're real in the sense that things in your imagination are real. Yeah, you know, your thoughts are real. Your thoughts are real. You have them. They're they're product of your experiences and everything yeah. like that. And you know, your imagination can feel uh, very alive. And uh, you know, it's a complicated uh, question, I guess. But to me, in like terms to, of I like to start out with like complication, and then we make it simple. All right. You know, the appeal of the game, partially at least from a dungeon master's perspective, is like I get to make this world, this this thing that, that comes mm -hmm. to life and and populate it and, and 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 sort of craft it. And the the whole art of just world building is a hobby in and of itself, a separate from RPGs. So like you know, you got this thing in front of you that you need to make. But at the same time, it needs to be able to work as a place to play in. Mm -hmm. And for me, realness in an RPG sense is that that sweet spot between detail and specificity and evocative minutia and accessibility, playability, something's going on, there's, there's conflicts for us to get involved in, we can make a difference, we can have an adventure. And it's the meeting of those two things that are are what I'm looking for. What I think yeah. of when I think of it feels real. Yeah, you, you want know. the players to stop and smell the roses, but also look up at the hook you're trying to give them. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> you can't, you know, everybody's heard stories of those settings that are popular and, and, you know, oh my goodness, I love this particular setting. Planescape is sometimes mentioned as one of those, although I see a lot more people attempting uh, to play in it nowadays, where it's like, Oh yeah, this is great. It's evocative, all this stuff, but man, it's really difficult to get into it because of the jargony words they've got, the sort of the slang, yeah, yeah. Uh, the cant, uh, as it were, or all the factions, or the fact that like the entire multiverse is open to you. That's it's just intimidating for some. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of players who feel that way about like homebrew worlds that are really built up and. Uh, you know, significantly diverge from mainline D and D. You want to have something that people can understand, mm -hmm. they can grasp, they can you know pick a piece and go like, "This is for my character. I really want to latch onto this." And then in the game, are like it comes to life. They want to interact with it. They ask questions. What's going on? How does this work? Mm -hmm. Can I use this to further my goals? All those things are. Uh, you know, you can assist those with yeah. uh, evocative world building. The the parts of, of making it real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like like you like you just mentioned. You know, you want to get stuff that the players latch onto. So you got to know what they want. Yes. Right. Yeah. And you have to like build that. You really do have to build. And you that, have to yeah. like give it back to them in a way that they <laughs> can see what you're seeing. So yes. there obviously has to be a commonality of reference. Yeah. Uh, you know, a reading list you give them. 
uh, or, you know, hey, what do you like? Yeah. Like, what do you like, Jim? You asking know? about it, yeah, yeah. Asking the survey. I like that one survey you did for, for uh, the Star of Bound, for like the movies that they like, mm -hmm. or how would you, how would your character, or how would just you, not even a character you'd play, but just you, yeah. react to these certain situations in order to get a feel for that. This has a long tradition in Dungeons and Dragons of like, a shared imaginative space yeah. is, I think, what we're talking about. And and that's why there's Appendix N in the first edition DMG. It's why all of these sort of literary references uh, mm -hmm. to Dungeons and Dragons uh, are, are helpful in understanding the game. It's why settings that come with a, a sort of an accessible built-in canon yeah. remain ever popular. <laughs> you know, that, that licensed RPGs still you know, sort of remain a thing. You know, you have that ability to get involved in it understand what's going on and not necessarily get too bogged down in things. Mm -hmm. Ask you what they like. It's a good place to, to get the references in place. Yeah. But that's when you get to do the part that I know you love, which is <laughs> assembly. assembling at all. Yeah. Assembly. And so yeah. how, how is it that you like to assemble your your parts once you know what your players like? I will start with a campaign with whatever it is in my that's rattling around my head that's got me on fire. Mm -hmm. And I will start bigging it up, talking it up <laughs> to the players as in, it'll lead up to the campaign. Like, oh, I've got this idea for this, you know, kind of country or or this sort of situation. Or what about like, have you ever thought this thing about this monster or whatever sort of like I've got going on, you know, as an environment, a situation, a certain type of genre that I'm looking for. Yeah. And uh, I will assemble myself images, uh, you know, stories, things I find online, mm -hmm. movies, comics, whatever. Yeah. Start sharing those with the players. Yeah, I like and, to make a Pinterest board. Yeah, it's Pinterest a, board it's is a great way. Perfect to... for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you could just share that and 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 sort of uh, you know let them see where your head is at. Because this is the part of RPGs that I find the most fascinating. And to me, the the shared imaginative space and the the position of like the dungeon master almost is like a shamanic figure <laughs> of sorts, like leading a group of people through this other world. And the closer you can get to everybody kind of imagining the same thing, I don't know, the more powerful it is, the more well, just it feels, evocative it, it is. It feels like a spell that you're all casting. Once you actually get yeah. one on the same page, you're casting a spell together to create this story. Yeah, this yeah. World, it, however you want to see it, right? <laughs> right, yeah. It becomes something more than the sum of its parts, which is, you know, it's transcendent, you know? Mm -hmm. I find that working towards this and building a solid foundation for my imagination, not rules not yeah. not not system yeah yeah but like i i've got my friends i want to play with and now i'm soaking myself in this fuel for what's going to propel the game forward and you know eventually the game itself will generate its own inspirations right but here in the beginning i want like strong tone strong genre and things like that mm -hmm. and input from the players uh which i do much more informally you know it's more just getting yeah. to know them that kind i mean of. but do you uh when you're doing this are you worried about like like the flora and fauna are you, are you like <laughs> when does that come along in your creative process i mean at this point everything is on the table yeah it might be everything if i might have jotted down a note for a specific type of environ or or terrain feature or mm -hmm. a specific monster or something like that or it might be much more like big you know cosmic scale it might be a pantheon it might be a certain type of cosmic conflict that I'm looking to have a, a, a stage for, right. uh, for this thing. And so at this stage, when I'm assembling everything, there is nothing too small, nothing too big. Mm -hmm. it, it all goes into basically a list, <laughs> you know, and I'll, you know, write out maybe a couple of words about what it is that's evocative to me. The idea here is that I'm prepping a, a big stew pot <laughs> of, of stuff that's inspiring me, and I'll eventually start winnowing it down, combining things and the like. Uh, but that's kind of jumping ahead. Uh, right, right, right. You've kind of gotten your world ready. So what, where do you start populating it other than that? As far as like yeah. the people in it. The people in it. Yeah, there was a time in my life when I would have dug up the medieval demographics. Mm -hmm. I would have I would have looked and seen, you know, how many people per square mile, things like that. And if that was important to the game I was running, I'd find, you know, a way to incorporate that. But I now look at much more of a, uh, a small scale game play focused model. So I'm like, I need a starting region. You know, I need a place, a settlement, a home base, somewhere where they start. Mm -hmm. And if it feels contrived, then I might make reference to that contrivance while they were creating characters. So an example might be, all right, you can make whatever character you want, but you're starting in this place. This is the situation. So come with a, an idea of why you're here. 
Yeah. You know, if you're from one part of the world or the empire or whatever, like, why are you at the other side? What brought you here? You know, I'm already starting to, like, talk to the players about the kind of characters they're wanting to make, uh, what's interesting them, trying to get convince them all the way to make their characters at a session zero as opposed to on their own, uh, which is, you know, you know what are you going to do? Letting the players know that there is more detail there if they want to access it. Because one of my guiding principles in role-playing is that the lore is optional. And this is the, I'm, I get the gasp that, <laughs> that, that went across. <laughs> Your players are there to play D&D. Your players are there to have an exciting adventure. Your players are there to have fun with their friends, to do something social, to roll dice, have snacks, whatever. The lore of the world is nice and should be the superstructure that sort of like supports the campaign and it should be accessible if the players want to, but it should not be necessary. Yeah, it shouldn't be necessary for them to go into taverns or walk down the road without... You know, yeah. you how do I do expounding this? <laughs> on <laughs> right. what this road is, why it's here, and who yeah. guards it? And it's like, yeah, yeah too, there's such a thing as too much detail. Yeah. So, no, I, 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 I will admit to <laughs> I, being I that DM. I have two as well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have all this stuff that you're like, but I wrote it. And yeah. It's like, well, yeah, but did they ask about it? But did they ask about it? Is it relevant? And, and so much, so much RPG material is just detail. Yeah. A lot about where it's just like, this is fluff. We don't need it. <laughs> yeah, and when you have that too much, your players will check out, and now you out. they have disengaged from the world, Yeah, and it is no longer real. It's no longer real. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's just like, oh, if I, I don't want to go in that cave because I'm going to have to hear the history without They're ever right. knowing or, about <laughs> why... <laughs> Why would I know this? <laughs> right, why would I know this? Or, <laughs> yeah. or like the big evocative details of, yeah. of every location. Box text is a classic example of this, yeah. where it's like the box text goes on and on, it fills up like half a column or more mm -hmm. of a page, and you forget what all's there, where a short bullet-pointed list with a quick of set of like evocative words, which are also happen to be the things in the room that the players are most likely to interact with, yeah. like that's a more gameplay-focused model as opposed to big descriptions, lots of detail, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, pointing out those little details in a room or in a location, it is in effect making them sparkle, like in video yeah, games. Yeah, it's like, it is, oh, yeah. I want to go check that out. You're letting them you know. know. You're telegraphing. These are the elements of, of the game that I'm, I'm ready for you guys to interact with. Mm -hmm. Ready for you guys. And, and that works at the micro level of room to room dungeon crawling. It works at the macro level of we've entered a city. Here, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Or, or, you, or you've entered a new hex. <laughs> right. This is what you can yeah. see on the horizon. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether it's a mountain or obviously there's, you can hear water in the distance. Yeah. You know, like you're letting them know, like, hey, you can go check that river out or maybe it's a lake. And if you're throwing a lot of useless detail out there, then your players are not going to be able to, like you said, pick up on what's, of all the things that were listed, What's important? <laughs> what's in, not just what's important, but can I go over there and is there something to do? Or if I go over there and ask questions, is it just going to be nothing? Yeah. And oftentimes, at least I find as a player, and, and sometimes when I'm a DM, I'm like, wait a minute, that player was looking for something to do. Why did I tell, why did I just give them this boring thing? Yeah. Why did I just give them this thing that did not engage them in the way that they were looking for? And so a lot of this mixes up world building and how you do things in the scene. And it's a... Uh, it's a technique and sort of approach to the game that, that is holistic. There's not mm -hmm. like any one area to necessarily focus on. Right, right. You're getting your world, you're, you're paring it down to what you need to tell them. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, how, do, how does all this come together? How Ooh. does this <laughs> synthesize, so to sure. speak, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you make it all just kind of, mm. So I'll walk you through my process for it, which is that I've assembled the pieces. These are both inspirational sources for myself, the players, feedback that I've gotten from them, whatever. Now I start making associations. I've got this big list of stuff floating around my head. And right now, if I were to make a game out of it in its atomized individual parts, it would be making no sense whatsoever. And so I start looking for associations. This is where my own personal interests really help fuel this part of DMing, because I'm interested in weird esoteric stuff. You know, like I always have been. <laughs> Everybody else is doing normal things. And I was like, I don't know, that seems like a weird prophecy from ancient times or, yeah. you know. And so I go looking for the symbolism of heraldic animals and beasts, uh, the origins of words, particularly words that have fantastic associations uh, with them, like the origins of the word dwarf or elf. Go looking for the historical antecedents to things that are portrayed in D&D &D and, and sort of like dig deep into that. 
uh, real world esoteric and arcane traditions are, are another source that I like just going and checking out because they're always weirder and, and more bizarre than, than what's in the base game because the base game needs to be accessible and kind of on purpose uh, vague and, and bland isn't the right word because that suggests I don't like it. I like it this way so that I can make it what I want. Well, yeah, it, it, it needs to have some kind of relatability to modern day people. Certainly, yeah. Whereas, you know, when you go back in history, these people had no idea what they were looking around at and they were just making up on their level, what they thought it was, <laughs> right. which is why it's batshit insane. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. let me give you, so let's take an example of that, right? Yeah. Like when it comes to building a Pantheon, most DMs and most RPG products approach it from a sense of, all right, there needs to be a god of X or a goddess of X. And the X is one of these 20 or 30 war, love, the sun, healing. They always will correspond with the domains somehow. Yeah. And like, that's a very utilitarian, modern, yeah. this is all well categorized. The evil gods are evil because they, they are patrons of evil things. Mm -hmm. You know, slaughter and pestilence and things like that. But real gods in our own world did not develop that way. They developed right. that way out of the needs of a community who were like, well, we deal with cattle disease all the time or, or crop failures or low birth rates or whatever. Like, <laughs> is there some force in the world that we could appeal to because the world seems so chaotic and strange, we have very little control over it. Maybe there's something out there that controls it we can appease, yeah. uh, make sacrifices to, and then that becomes personified over time, associated with a particular location, so that you have the god of this city. Athena is the goddess of Athens, you know, yeah. or, or whichever, Marduk, uh, <laughs> you know, the god of whichever Sumerian uh, city that is, and, and they have eclectic, weird portfolios. It's why you get things like uh, the goddess of love and filth and the sewers and war. And you're like, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so... Love is a battlefield. Right, right. And so that's how I like approaching my pantheons. So that there are gods and goddesses of strange things and weird yeah. stuff. And like, you think of like, say, the, the religion practice at the end of the Roman Republic as it's about to become an empire is inherited from centuries of religious practice and they don't even know why they're doing things necessarily anymore they're just i mean they just just kind of refile like file the serial numbers <laughs> off the greek gods <laughs> in right? a lot of ways and the greek gods were purposely presented as do this please we all, all the gods are the, one and the same in this sort of mm -hmm. pan-hellenic uh time period so mm -hmm. i like taking inspiration from those sources and start making associations between my list of inspirations so that i can start seeing where the symbolic overlap is the overlap between what the players are interested in and what I'm interested in. And then I start collapsing options. I start thinking, like, once I've got some good connections going and, and just sort of associations of things, then I can start going, all right, well, these two things are very similar. Let's combine them. Uh, if I've got like a bandit group and a, a, you know, a humanoid group that are both up to no good, maybe I'm just going to combine those two. Yeah. You know, players are wanting to deal with themes of monarchs and rulership and politics and things like that, then maybe I'm going to select monsters that symbolize monarchy. Lots of lion monsters in the monster manual, right? Lots of big lions that have the parts or faces of people. That seems like it might be significant. Like, where do manticores come from? Oh, they're a heraldric beast that appears on royal coats of arms. You know, like, all of those things start to combine until eventually I have the crowned beast, the king of the manticores, who is a personification of the rights to rulership. But given that a manticore is this vicious, hateful kind of thing, mm -hmm. it's also, what does that say about the, 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 the sort of the quality of the government here? Like, what, what does that uh, mean if this vicious beast is the uh, personification of it? Probably know? authoritarian in some way. Some way, right? <laughs> yeah. Probably not a democracy. It's probably not. You know, that's, that's all right for a fantasy world. Maybe a demonocracy. Probably. So. <laughs> and so, like, that's, that's sort of just, like, a, a quick and dirty example of it, but I might spend months doing this. Yeah. And I, this is while I'm running other campaigns. Following that, once I've kind of collapsed my options down, I've got the pieces I want to make play the game with it's about execution yeah if final assembly occurs in in play the broad strokes are outlined i've got some vague details and i'm talking like a couple of lines max <laughs> of description i don't like going into a lot of detail because to me the more detail i go into the less space i leave players yeah the less space i leave the game to react to what happens at the table yeah 
Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I want to be as concise as possible yeah. while still relaying the image I'm yeah. trying to relay. So, um, yeah, yeah. So how right. do you do that? How do you, uh, well, how do you do that? What I like to do are make uh, adjective lists. Yeah. Like, right now, Symbarum, they're going to be in the forest a lot. Yeah. Right? So I need adjectives <laughs> for different <laughs> depths of the forest. Uh-huh. How thick is it? How thin? You know, like, are you, yeah. are you deep in the bush? Are, yeah. you know, different kinds of weather in that environment? Yeah. Right? What's yeah. it going to be like? Is it dry? Is it humid? Is it sticky? Is it gross? Is it, you know, I mean, yeah. is it constant rain? Therefore, yeah. there's slush. You have to think about certain situations based on uh, where you are in, 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 you know, weather, time of year. Yeah. And just come up with a list. And I, I try to only, I try to start with like five to eight. Yeah. It right? doesn't need to be a lot. We're not talking a lot, lot here. Yeah. Because all you're doing is setting a scene. You always add more. And you can always add more later. So all you need to do is set the scene and then try to engage at least two senses, Silly, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, usually it's sight and sound. Yeah. But, you know, if they're touching a lot of stuff, touch, you know, smell. Yeah. I'm trying to get more i've done it a few times where you let one of the players describe what they like what does it smell like to you yeah yeah yeah. you know like once you've described a couple of senses let them fill a sense in right right yeah. and so they start building onto the scene too yeah and therefore you're getting them more engaged yeah it starts to feel more real and gritty very much especially if you do if you have those players who get that level of detail and get that mm-hmm. you know that level of description or and this is what i've found as a when i'm a player if you're playing with DMs who are used to approaching the game from that way, then throwing them this bone saying like, here's the broad parameter, it's a hot and muggy day in the forest. What does that feel like for you? What do you experience? Mm-hmm. How do you deal with it? Yeah, does it invoke some kind of sense memory from your PC? Yeah. Right? Yeah, because the less you're dictating to the players, anything other than what their senses perceive, you're kind of stepping on that those toes of like, is this player autonomy issue, DM, you know, stepping the line, but also like, you're getting the actual players involved. <laughs> well, yeah, because guess what? Maybe there are players from a place that's hot and muggy, and it reminds them of home. Right? Right? Sure. Right? Yeah. So you, you as the as the DM, are trying to relate. So, oh, this is oppressive, and it's like, oh, this is like a day on the farm. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And if you're playing with players who are bouncing off of each other's ideas and using their imaginations to springboard something mm-hmm. else, at which is you know a skill, and you want to encourage it. We've got a video on that. Uh, <laughs> then. You are throwing fuel, uh, you know, you're throwing fuel on the imagination mm-hmm. fire. And, and and also getting everybody in that same shared imaginative space mm-hmm. is really important and, and evocative. Yeah, so. and, and something you told me about uh, is, is making a weather chart. Oh, so yes. the weather can feel like, <laughs> yeah. because let, let the dice tell you how certain parameters function because oh, yes. it lends to that randomness. Or not randomness, but you know what I mean. Like, it's not like, oh... Uh, it's sunny today, you yeah. know, and it's just like the DM just decided. It's like, no, 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 I rolled on a chart. And yeah. Based on, you know, how I continue to roll, you'll see how the weather changes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having those little quick little systems in place can help you with that, especially as you move beyond like individual scene setting or building like world elements that mm-hmm. are, uh, you know, kind of evocative. To me, the next step in creating a living world is execution at the table and keeping track of everything. You know, this is one of those things where I think when pe- when people hear the world's believable, it feels real, etc., they think, oh God, <laughs> I have to have this massive system. I've got to be playing a game that exhaustively details everything, that has a unified mechanics for all of it, that, that we every minute detail needs to be taken account for in the game system, and number one, no, no, that's not at all <laughs> uh, what we're going for. And and I would say personally that I've found that the beauty of uh, non-unified game systems and just understanding die probabilities yeah. goes a long way towards um, <laughs> giving myself the tools I need to make ad hoc rulings in terms of, oh, okay, well, you know, there's not really a system for this, but I think it's kind of like that. You know, you know, just roll this die and, and, and mm-hmm. this is the number you're looking for. Because if you try to exhaustively detail everything in the effort to have an evocative setting, you're going to wear yourself out and it's going to be unwieldy. Yeah. So, and, uh, well, and you also, <laughs> if it's unwieldy, then that means you're going to forget the details. Yes. Thus, you're, hand, you're handicapping yourself. Yeah, you really, you're yeah, overloading you really yourself with too many options to present them. Certainly, certainly. And so uh, you have things like uh, die oracles, dice oracles, uh, one where we've talked about them before, but in a quick recap, it's like take any die pool that you want. Sometimes uh, it would be like roll one of each die. Other times uh, you roll just whatever you are, 
whatever the die represents, you roll that many of. So in the examples that I use, I use them for factions. And the die size represents the strength and, and ability to affect the game world of the faction. Mm -hmm. I have as many of those as I have factions, and I roll all of those dice. All the ones that come up one are going to mean that that faction has taken a move towards uh, its goals. And I keep track of where the different factions are in their progress towards their goals with countdown clocks, uh, which I first saw in Blades in the Dark, but I know a lot of games uh, mm -hmm. sort of use them. And these two tools, this sort of like randomized, when do the factions make their move, and like keeping track of it with a simple visual aid that you can also kind of tell the players, oh wait, the, the Inquisition faction just got another you know, tick on their clock towards their goal. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like gives you a bit of a metagame, sort of a, oh, you guys better hurry up. <laughs> or yeah. Actual watch. Uh, <laughs> and, okay. Don't um, that. And so describe the watch to me, Jim. Uh, right, it's so <laughs> black, and uh, <laughs> and so the idea is that you know these ones come up, and that also means the this is the moment where the players get involved. Is it one faction that that got the one, and they go seeking the players' aid, or the players have something they want, depending on if they're antagonistic or not? But if it's like two factions that came up with a one, then it's like now their goals are working across purposes, and the players are caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. And just this sort of simple thing, I also use it the uh, for to determine like celestial alignments yeah, and yeah. things like that. You can do the same thing. This star is represented by this die. And then, uh, like you were saying, the hex map uh, weather generator. <laughs> you take a small hex map and you color code it towards certain weather and then you roll randomly on it. Yeah. And the, if, depending on how you've uh, laid out the sections, it creates for a very natural feeling like, oh, it's a hot and muggy day, it's probably gonna rain soon. And oh, lo and behold, half the hexes that it touches would lead to rain. Otherwise. Right. Yeah, and so you just sort of roll on that um, and it's, it's a one thing. You don't have to look up a chart. Yep. <laughs> you don't do anything else. It's just this color-coded picture. Yep. For mine, uh, I, I roll on. on it twice a day. Yeah. Uh, so you can see what it's like when you wake up. But it's you can see what it's tending towards. Oh, there's, oh, yeah. there's dark clouds yeah. on the horizon. Yeah. Because I rolled rain for later in the day. Sure, sure. Um, so. those, are, uh, those are really fun ways to make the world feel alive and feel mm -hmm. real. Very detailed, wandering monster uh, charts would do the same thing. We have kind of thrown a lot. This people. is a lot. This so, is a lot. So yeah. kind of as we're wrapping this up, I think one of the main things is you can prep, but don't over prep. Oh God. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, like with the adjective list, just have five to eight, yeah. you know, if that. Yeah. And if you only use one or two, then you don't need to expand on it just yet. Yeah. You have more adjectives to fall back on. Exactly. You know? Exactly. But the weather chart, you don't have to really do anything but roll on it for the session. So it's a, yeah. it's a fun, that's why I like it, because it's just there. It's just there. When I need it, I just use it. And it's also like a five by five hex. It's not like a huge thing. You yeah. have it in the corner of a piece of note, or you clip it to your DM screen or something. Yeah. Avoiding over prep is going to be key for both like your own burnout, uh, making mm -hmm. sure, like if you over prep, you're more likely to create a world that the player are hemmed in by yeah. as opposed to uh, empowered by and uh, you know you just first off you just don't need that much mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and, and I, this is something that I personally uh, struggle with when I prep because I'm like oh man d100 list that's what I need and then it's like no you don't d6 d8 <laughs> you yeah. know especially for things that are meant to be iconic of the setting or iconic of, of this particular region or something like if the players are only going to visit it once or twice, like I might, I might just be like, this, "These are the encounters that are here." <laughs> you know, uh, this is just what's going to. There's nothing else here. Uh, if they're going to come through a couple of times, or it's going to be a home base or something, I might uh, start with something small and then add on to it as play progresses. Add NPCs to that list. Add uh, rivals and. Mm -hmm. and opportunities for the players to accomplish things. It doesn't all have to be combat or confrontational things. Yeah, and also uh, I think player input is important as you move yeah. along, Yeah. right? Uh, I mean, the players can, can help you add to those lists yeah. as they interact with the world. Yeah. And you know you can work together to, to do that. That brings up a really good point. That's not necessarily a pitfall, but as a way of uh, sort of getting feedback is asking these specific questions. What about my world feels real? <laughs> In this last session, I was trying to do X. Do you think I accomplished that? Mm -hmm. Can you give me specific examples? The more specific you get with your questions soliciting feedback, <laughs> the less options there are for the players to go, I liked it. It was good. <laughs> it was good. Uh, and, and sort of, you know, when you're looking for specific feedback, asking specific questions is the way to go. Um, but back to sort of pitfalls, 
uh, yeah, avoiding over prep so that you don't wear yourself out, but you also leave room for the players and, mm -hmm. and like knowing that the feedback you get at session zero is, is you're going to need to update that. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> right? you, you want to, you need to grow what you need yeah. and tend your garden of, of, of DM tools yeah. well, yeah. instead of just like, you don't want to just plant a bunch of wheat. Yeah, so to speak. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you tend, yeah, tend your player garden is yeah. good. Uh, good. Uh, and so uh, finally, I just would leave with leaving something of like the leave on the idea of the play is the thing that yeah. all of this, all of the props and the books and the rules and the techniques, it's all designed to facilitate the experience of play. And so anything that doesn't gets cut. <laughs> It just, uh, that might be your baby. It might be the most, if you can't find a way to make it work, it gets cut. Because save it for another campaign. Save it for another campaign. Save it for later. Rework it uh, and put it in some other time. Uh, because what happens at the table during play is, is the most important part of this the whole thing. And like, it should be the priority. Yeah. And that's that's really where, uh, where the buck stops for me. Yeah. And however many versions are... It's where the species of buck that you have. Yeah, that's where the... <laughs> if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. What, what point? Uh, like what? Yeah, we might need to cut this minute because I need to get my thoughts in order. No, 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 that's it's, all right. It's okay. Uh, let them see the process. Um, let them just let them see it all. Let them see how the sauce all is the made. All the gristle and gore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the word salad that'll tumble out.